Hi, everybody. Happy Friday for those of you in the U.S. coming up on a holiday weekend. Um, I'm Rita McGrath. You probably knew that. My uh, guest this week is George Stock of the Boston Consulting Group, um, one of the foundational figures in the world of strategy. And I'm so, so thrilled to have an excuse to talk to you. (laughs) So that's exciting. Thank you. A couple of housekeeping notes. This is being recorded, so do not say anything that you do not want splashed on the front page of the New York Post. Um, And uh, we will be using the chat actively, so ask your questions there. Um, If we don't get to you live here, I capture them and we'll uh, get back to you after the lab session uh, occurs. Um, So thank you very much, those of you who are uh, attending and those of you watching afterwards. uh, Thank you for checking in. And so, George, welcome. <laughs> so delighted. Hey, Maria, it's good to see you again. It's been a long time since I've seen you in person. Yes. I think the last time we were together virtually was that thing I did for the Strategic Management Society. That, yes. Which, which was fun, which was fun. Um, so maybe for those folks who don't know you, maybe give us a little bit of your background. Gosh. Um, well, I, I'm currently a senior advisor to the Boston Consulting Group. I retired a few years back, primarily so I could pursue some other things that weren't on a mandate of a senior partner for the BCG. But I joined BCG in 1978 um, and worked in the the Boston office, spent most of my time in Tokyo and then Chicago. And then I opened Toronto uh, where I spent the bulk of my time actually. Um, but I'm an engineer by training. I grew up in the U.S. military, so I've lived all over the, the world. Um, and I'm ready to stop doing that. I'm ready <laughs> to stay put for a while. Well, you were basically paying rent on airplanes, as I recall. I mean, you were That's right. just, I mean, I remember reading about your travel schedule. In fact, there was a, wasn't there a Fast Company article that there was. sort of detailed how, how much, how what a toll it took on you, really? Yes, well, it was supposed to be an article about George Stock is an innovator in strategy. And uh-huh. it turned about turned out to be an article about consultant kills himself working too hard. <laughs> or almost kills himself working too hard. But it was true. I mean, I I, I can't falter. And she, you know, she had an award for it. And uh did she? Oh. She did. Oh, it's a real, really so for those of you that don't know this, there was a fascinating profile done in Fast Company. It's a little while ago now, about um uh just how 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 close you came to really running off a cliff <laughs> and then right. how you didn't. Um, I try but, not to talk about that. <laughs> sorry? I try not to think about that. I, I, yeah. Well, <laughs> anyway, uh, you didn't. Here you are. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about strategy. So I joined the field, you know, when it was already fairly well developed, but you were there probably right around the beginning of what we currently think of as the core practice of strategy today. And I'd love to, your thoughts on how it's evolved. I, well, I joined when people might have called it the golden age. Mm. Uh, that's when we moved from good management to competitive advantage and mm-hmm. ex- identifying competitive advantage and exploiting it through strategy. Strategy is about using a competitive advantage. So there's really two parts. There's I got to find competitive advantage and then I got to figure out how to use it. Mm-hmm. So the golden age was uh, the experience curve. Actually, and BCG was at the golden age. From, from Absolutely. My- much of that. Mm-hmm. So we did the experience curve, which is costs go down forever. And if you know that and your competitors don't know that, you could do nasty things to them. Mm-hmm. And we did. Mm-hmm. So um, maybe uh, for those that don't know it, let's let's just, it, there are still people I run into who do not know what the experience curve is. So I'll give my version and see if I get it right. Sure. Uh, so, <laughs> so this was a finding that came out of the learning curve research yes. back in the day when people were looking at airplane manufacturing, if memory serves me. And they came upon this interesting discovery that as your amount produced accumulates, as you produce more, your unit costs decrease in a specific and predictable way. Um, And that then led to the experience curve matrix, which basically said, if you've got a dominant share in a growing industry, you have the chance of getting ahead of your uh, colleagues uh, on cost. And you could then use that to your own advantage if they weren't aware of that, right? Did I get that right? That's right. That's very good. But the hardball nature of it is if you know that and your competitors don't know that, you can do nasty things. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it was the Japanese that knew it. They figured Uh, it out first. And the Western world didn't. So the Japanese, for example, semiconductors were pricing ahead of 
where actual production was because they knew actual production was going to reach a point where the cost would, would, uh, would match, uh, would be in line with pricing. Mm -hmm. So that was the big knock through uh, breakthrough. And that, that actually carried BCG for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And then the next big move is, I would say pretty much out of date today, but back then it made a lot of sense was the gross share matrix, mm -hmm. the, the famous dogs, cats, stars, and <laughs> question and, marks, <laughs> question marks. And, uh, what most people don't understand is that actually was rooted in the need to manage cash within a corporation. Mm -hmm. And I say it's out of date, not because it's wrong, but because cash now can be managed so much more broadly, not just within the walls of a corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's still interesting to look at it as a way to, uh, for example, assess a portfolio. Mm -hmm. So that happens a lot. Well, I think um, even today, when we teach corporate strategy, um, there are not you know, is super wealth. We you know we're not super wealthy in terms of tools for understanding corporate strategy. We really aren't. Um, That's a good point. And, and the BCG matrix is one of the first that really tackled that. So, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, what it basically said is, if you have a dominant share in a growing sector that that's your shooting stars and that's where you should invest if you have a dominant share in a slow sector those are your cash cows so you can extract some cash from them um if you've got a dominant share but it's you know so if you've got a small share in a in a not growing market that that's that's a dog and you know dog. look at those and, and perhaps consider exiting and nobody knew what to do about the fourth quadrant <laughs> <So>. <laughs> But I still think it, it made an impression on people because it was a point of departure. At least you had a place to start thinking about what right. those parts of your portfolio were like. And a way to look at complex businesses. Mm -hmm. And complex businesses can, can be more than just conglomerates. I mean, a business with 100 products, for example, is a complex business that has its own dogs and stars and, and cash cows. And I think the next innovation uh, that, that really took the world was uh, what we call average costing. Um, and average costing is that the people have a tendency to average the cost and set their prices. Mm -hmm. um, and wow. in reality, some products are because of volume mainly are lower cost to manufacture and some products because of lower volumes are higher cost. Uh, and same with services, life insurance policies are a good example that we first came upon um, where it costs as much to sell a large life insurance policy almost as much as it does to do a small insurance policy. So many people average those costs and set a price. Um, if you know your costs better than your competitors and you know this is going on, uh, you can take advantage of it and you could underprice, apparently underprice competitors who don't know, understand this. Mm -hmm. And again, it was a Japanese phenomenon that we observed uh, and people typically called it coming in on the low end um, but it really was a focus strategy. It's, now it's called focus. Mm -hmm. um, then after that, uh, probably not as well known as the first few was what we call stalemate strategies. So there are certain businesses that it's just almost impossible to gain a, a cost advantage. They typically are businesses where uh, the unit of scale is, a, is, is small enough that it's available to everybody. So paper making is a typical example, because I could go out and buy a big paper machine and be the world's lowest cost producer of paper overnight of a particular paper. Same with an airplane. I could buy a certain airplane and be the lowest cost producer of air travel on a certain route. Um, semiconductors is another good example. Um, and so those are businesses that are really hard to manage. And about the best that we found people could do with those businesses is don't invest in them. If, if people want to stay in those businesses, I guess what it's popularly called sweat the assets and, and, uh, in uh, LBO terminology, but it was the notion that let's squeeze as much as we can out of the existing assets. And that actually would produce a low cost position. Um, but the issue, the, the essence of stalemate is that people assume there's a certain margin in, the, in their forthcoming inv investment. But when that investment shows up, it knocks people off the, the cost curve and the cost curve becomes less and less steep and the flatter it becomes, the harder it is to get a cost advantage. Mm -hmm. And so I would say the first 20 years of ECG was about cost, cost, mm -hmm. cost, cost, cost. Mm -hmm. In fact, we had a song called Cut Price, Add Capacity. 
Uh, we used to sing to ourselves. You had a song? It's a song, yeah. <laughs> we were nerds, strategy <laughs> nerds. Uh, time was actually the first step away from that. Yeah, so um, the background on that, right? You discovered time-based competition and wrote an article, which, I mean, I, I remember reading a story about how that single article set up a whole practice for BCG for years. It did. And they didn't believe you at first though, right? Well, actually even within BCG, I ran into a lot of uh, uh, resistance. I remember one senior colleague of mine telling me it was an accounting phenomena that the Japanese had come up with, hmm. but, but we weren't doing accounting. We were doing physical measurements. Mm -hmm. And when I went to Japan, I went, expecting to find more and more ways to, to achieve lower cost. Uh, what happened early on was I began to see examples where, yes, the Japanese were low, lower cost, but stuff was going through their factory 10 times faster than in the West. And that really intrigued me because cost I could deal with, but, but time is something uh, that you can't really buy. You got to go out and, and basically change the way the organization operates. Uh, and the, the emphasis has to shift from cost to cost plus time. Mm -hmm. um, and the real interesting transition was to use it to create all new strategies. So instead of competing on lower price, lower price, lower price, because we're lower cost, lower cost, lower cost, uh, we could instead compete on how do people value responsiveness? And it's not just responsiveness in terms of how fast can I give you something you've asked for, but it's how fast can I give you what you've asked for? Mm -hmm. uh, and so variety became an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and we began to see examples of after examples where companies were using this to uh, s s switch competitive positions. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, again, it was the Japanese that were the furthest ahead, but very quickly, uh, particularly in the United States, and then later in Europe and Australia, uh, I recall, uh, companies, usually companies that had run out of options, frankly, um, saw time as a way out of their bind. Mm. Mm. And so they got so stuck and then we're out of, let's <laughs> give it a try. We're, we're sure to do the right thing after we've exhausted all other alternatives. It, well, yeah. <laughs> well, usually they waited so long. I had one client said, we like to wait. We, we like to keep all our options open until we have none. <laughs> and, uh, and they basically went out of business <laughs> because that's, that's their good. option went to zero. Uh, so this, this was also part of what really sparked the whole um, lean, you know, lean inventory, just lean, in time, lean engineering, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. I mean, you were really at the forefront of that. Well, um, both the lean and re-engineering are, are very powerful mm -hmm. management techniques, but they're not strategy. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're focused on cost. Mm -hmm. And strategy is when I can take an advantage and do something with it, mm -hmm. not just take a cost and, right. and hopefully drop it to the bottom line. Uh, and so that began a long run uh, for BCG of using time as a competitive weapon. And in a simplest statement, it's like, how do I give my customers what they want, when they want it, where they want it, uh, at a price they can afford? Mm -hmm. uh, and that was extremely powerful. Well, it's still powerful today. I mean, look at Amazon. You know, in fact, the interesting point about all these strategies, Rita, is they build on each other. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't take your eye off a of scale, even though focus is important. You can't take take an eye off a of focus because complexity affects time, and so they it's like a stair step. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things we talked about in Hardball was the reward for a successful strategy is competition. Mm -hmm because it forces competitors to find a way around you. <laughs> right. So the, we're, we're talking about the book, Hardball. I have my well dog-eared copy right that. Sorry? <laughs> That's good to see it. <laughs> there you go. Um, so I remember when that book came out, and I do want to come back to time, because some, some years later, you wrote a book, an article called Japan's Dark Side of Time. And I think there's this interesting strategy sorry, interesting phenomenon in strategy where once you've shown the world something works, then everybody piles on and your your advantage becomes the norm, you know, and, and right. it's sort of this ratchet effect, right? So I do want to come back to that, but let's talk about hardball for a minute because it was not without controversy when it first came out. True. Um, actually, hardball took almost 20 years to write. 
it originally started as a concept about uh, 10 strategies that always work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was a concept that we started talking about amongst ourselves because we kept seeing the same opportunities, problems over and over again, industry after industry, sometimes in the same industry. If enough time went by, uh, an old strategy could be made a new strategy. Um, it became hardball, I guess, in the late 1980s, or early 1990s, when people were talking about co-optition and cooperative uh, nature of, of business relationships, and, and, uh, and particularly in Europe, there was less talk about uh, competition and more talk about uh, let's cooperate. Mm -hmm. But to all my clients, and I'm going to go industry after industry, uh, they were in a fight to, for survival, uh, whether they were number one or number two. And you can see it in industry after industry. You got Komatsu versus Caterpillar and Boeing versus Airbus. And what's really interesting, in fact, both, both of those examples is the, the leadership positions flip. And they flip because somebody finds another form of competitive advantage that the others have missed. And usually it's because uh, Komatsu forced Caterpillar to do something different. And Cater Caterpillar transitioned into uh, basically the, the, the real-time construction piece of equipment, which is actively monitored and, and, and maintained, as opposed to you sell it and forget it. Uh, but Airbus and, and Boeing were the same. That's why I mentioned you know, the reward for a good strategy is, is a new competitor or a new way of competing. Mm -hmm. But what happened is, uh, and it relates to this Fast Company article, I, I, when I got out of the hospital, I had to do something with myself. I couldn't travel. Um, I'd written several books already and it was therapeutic. So I needed some therapy um, and I was mad. I was angry. I was angry because of what had happened to me. I was angry because I thought the world was getting soft and they weren't talking about this long list of companies that, that are struggling, whether they're number one or not. There's, mm -hmm. It's a battle. They can't let off the, 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 the gas pedal. And so it became hardball. And in particular, it became a, a notion that uh, it's one thing to have a strategy. It's another thing to pursue it. And well, and pursue it aggressively and aggressively. Because the window's not going to be there forever. Uh, again, the, the reward for a good strategy is competition. Um, and so we wanted people to, to start taking their, their strategy seriously. And uh, I think you know, the, the, probably the most uh, visible example of that was Jack Welch. And number, you're either going to be number one, number two, or I'm going to sell you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's that simple. It wasn't become number one or number two. People think it's that. It was actually you be number one or number two. Mm -hmm. Which he long. later walked back on. Yeah. So actually, because we, you know, it takes us back to time-based competition because business shifted from structural forms of competition to what we call behavioral forms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and time was at that transition point because it was about how companies behave. Mm -hmm. uh, and time is a measurement of, of behavior. Mm -hmm. And structure is about how big my machine is or how large my store is or how dense is my network? Mm -hmm. Behavior is how I brought all this to bear. Um, well, and increasingly what we've seen is it's access to assets, not actually having assets. And you know, many of the traditional ideas of entry barriers have disappeared only to be replaced by new kinds of entry barriers. A new form of barrier, exactly. And we were just talking about you know, the current tech giants. I mean, talk about hardball. I mean, those guys are you know, they're, they're at least as aggressive as any uh, company you mentioned in the book. That's correct. And I actually don't, as you say, I haven't been able to see around that corner yet. Of, you know, if you should tell me how to see around that corner. <laughs> Which one? The one, the one, the, 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 the big the tech, tech companies, companies, the big tech companies. And, and well, you know, how do you, how do you compete with somebody as overwhelming in position as Google or as uh, Facebook? Well, you know, history teaches us that institutions take anywhere from 20 to 30 years to catch up with the reality of what's unfolding in the world of technology and society. So if you look at what happened with big oil right back in the day, um, part of what changed was the regulatory regime changed. And so I've been saying for a while that we were going to start, we are going to start seeing different 
perspectives, different takes on the whole third party data business. Um, and so, you know, I could see something similar to what happened to tobacco. I could see something similar to what happened to the big, you know, oil monopolies or Ma Bell, uh, where, you know, there's an institutional reaction and you're seeing it in Europe already. Um, now what form that'll take, I don't know. And when I, you know, I can predict things, but not never when <laughs> Like I can sort of say weather. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, can, I feel pretty good about that. But when, when I couldn't tell you. So I do think that, um, and you, you point this out in the book, you say the competition happens within a regulatory and institutional regime. Sure. And, and so if that regime changes, you could expect to see changes. For instance, I think it's going to be very hard for the big tech players to continue to acquire as aggressively as they have to True. You know, prevent competition from coming in. And, you know, the the, the bad news is that the, all those little companies getting started are not going to have a ready exit. The good news is <laughs> those big companies are going to be forced to actually innovate themselves rather than rather than go, go outside. So, you know, there's some interesting early warnings that you can start to see. Um, one of the well, ones that... So well, exactly, I, can, I can imagine a world where, where companies begin to pop up that use Facebook as a, almost as a supplier. Mm-hmm and come up with business concepts uh, that Facebook doesn't, doesn't have, but they do because they, they know how to marry what Facebook can do with what they see a customer need to be. Mm-hmm. Now, as you say, in the past, Facebook would buy them mm-hmm. and absorb them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they may not be allowed to do that anymore. So these companies could, could grow on their own. And then the question becomes, do they end up being you know, supplier customer relationship that's stable or does one forward integrate or one backward integrate? Um, but it'll take, a, it'll take a while oh, yeah. to play yeah. it out. That's one of the interesting things about strategy. As great as an idea can be, it isn't overnight. There's okay. some things that happen quick, but quick's all relative. Mm-hmm. Quick to what? Well, you know, that's, that's something... I talk a lot about, which is, you know, the change happens gradually for a long, long, long time. And then suddenly, <laughs> you know, right. and that's where I think the opportunity is if you're paying attention to, to the weak signals. Um, so let's uh, talk about hardball for a minute in terms of, you know, the book came out, I think, 2004. Is that right? Uh, yeah. That's Who's right. counting? Right about, right about <laughs> that. Um, you know, have you seen things? Well, so a couple of points I think are worth mentioning. First of all, I think people misunderstand. The, the thrust behind the book, which is you don't have to be a bad person you know, to play hardball strategy. Uh, and in the book, you actually talk about Herb Kelleher from Southwest, yes. He's, you know, this beloved business leader, this warm human being names is airport love, you know, but, but in the book, you tell the anecdote about how United was taking on some of their roots. And he says, war has been declared or something like that. You know, com- right. hostilities have been commenced. That's what it was. Yes, right. <laughs> So, and, you know, so I think it's important to realize that, that competition is, you know, not, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you're, you're unethical. It means you're within the rules, you know, trying to, trying to figure out how to get your organization an advantage over others. And that's what makes capitalism work. I mean, to be honest. It was a, it was a, it was a hard, hard point to describe in the book. And we probably tried to describe it too many times. We talked, talked about the bright line Mm -hmm. and one has to understand where the line gets crossed. Mm-hmm. Um, right. But then we right. come back to example, it's, it's, it, the, you know, hardball doesn't hinge on that subtleness. Hardball hinges on a, a competitor decides it's going to do something, it's going to do something aggressively. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite examples is uh, the, what we call the Honda Yamaha war. And it, it, it broke out uh, after about 10 years of, aggressive competition from Yamaha to take share from Honda and motorcycles in Japan, which is a much bigger market for motorcycles than anywhere else in the world. Um, Now at the time, Honda was busy getting into automobiles. In fact, when I talked afterwards, when I talked to the Honda people, they said, of course, I like the way they said this. We took all our best people out of motorcycles and we put them in automobiles. We took all our best people out of motorcycle racing and we put them in automobile racing. I mean, it was a big corporate commitment. Oh, they took all their cash. I mean, the, the, the technical strategy for, you know, textbooks would say they moved their cash from one business. So they did. Um, and while that was happening, Yano Hawes said, this is an opportunity and I can, I can catch up with Honda. Where it was interesting, I was in Japan when this happened. They, mm-hmm. they uh, declared they're going to be number one in the, in the motorcycle business. 
they declared at a shareholder meeting. So it was public. Mm-hmm. Big, big mistake. You know, it's, it's, it's ter- a, a, a big competitive error is to brag. <laughs> Especially before you secured the opinion. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes <laughs> before you've gotten there. <laughs> and uh, Honda reacted. And, and the phrase, which doesn't really translate well, was, was uh, Yama wo Sabusu. And it really meant we will crush, squash, slaughter, destroy Yama. And so I said, this is going to be interesting. So let's watch this. Mm-hmm. And in the space of 18 months, uh, Honda did all the stuff one might expect. They increased advertising. Uh, they increased promotion. Uh, they sold motorcycles uh, in an attempt to stop Yamaha. But then they did something that I had never seen before. They started a variety war. In 18 months, they, uh, 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 Honda introduced and retired about 130 motorcycles. Yamaha was able, only able to get off about 30 shots. Huh. Um, now, that's aggressive enough on the surface, but imagine what happens when that hits the marketplace. Uh, from a customer standpoint, what happens is uh, Yamaha's motorcycles are seen as obsolete. You know, I don't want to buy it because it's old. There's something and in new Japan, from, that's a big deal. That's a very big deal. And it forced Yamaha to cut prices so low that um, at the depth of the war, you could buy a 10 speed, uh, you could buy a motorcycle for less than a 10 speed bicycle. That's how bad it, the 50 CC, that's how bad it had gotten. Now imagine if you're in the 10 speed bicycle business and these two guys come rumbling through your front yard. <laughs> that's that <laughs> well, that's the point that I make a lot, which is I think in strategy for many years, I think people misread a lot of what was being written about and they took industry as the main sort of bucket through which, through which lens you had to look at things. And I've always thought that was a big mistake. I like to think of it in terms of side swipes. Okay. People just, you know, they don't see it come in, they get sideswiped. And that's happening a lot right now because technology facilitates a lot of it does. ability to do side swipes. Yeah, it absolutely does. So um, one of the stories I love in the book is the story about Eagle Snacks and oh. Frito Lay. And the reason it resonates so much with me is like you, I spend a lot of my life on airplanes. And for for years, maybe not years, but for a while, the only thing that you got on the airplane were these little packets of, snacks. you know, Eagle Snacks. And then they, then they kind of disappeared. And it wasn't until I reread your chapter just recently that I um, that 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 I remembered. Oh yeah, those things were ubiquitous. Whatever happened to them? <laughs> so maybe you could retell that story because I think it's, it's fascinating. Of all the strategies in the book, because the book is about strategies that always work, and it's packaged as hardball. Um, that's the only one where people get it right away, which is we call it the overwhelming use of force. And Frito-Lay was, in that particular business, was overwhelmingly stronger than Anheuser-Busch. Um, and it's the same problem again, uh, where uh, Anheuser-Busch made a big deal about how they're going to unseat Frito-Lay. And Enrico uh, uh, Faraday, who was the CEO, uh, came in and said, no, it's not going to happen. We're not going to, we're not going to lose this position. Now, he just didn't pull the trigger. He, he took almost 18 months to get ready for the fight. And getting ready for the fight meant uh, reducing cost, uh, improving quality, uh, getting consistency way up in the factories, uh, uh, strengthening distribution and support, uh, and then pulling the trigger. And the trigger was cutting costs, cutting price, excuse me. And it was brutal to the point where Anheuser Bush publicly surrendered and exited the, the business. Mm-hmm. Now, the only people that really saw that going on was the trade, you know, the grocery stores, the convenience stores. The consumers really didn't see this unless you're on the airplane and suddenly there's no more Eagle Snacks. <laughs> right. <laughs> it doesn't mean that, that sitting on the airplane, people understood why there was no more Eagle Snacks. Um, but that was the, the most visible Absolutely. consequence of that. I mean, those things were ubiquitous. Um, so just to just to recap for those that haven't read the book yet, and you really should, it's if you're interested in strategy, this is really one of the core texts to me. So massive and overwhelming force anomalies, 
uh, threaten your competitors' profit sanctuaries. Now, that's a really interesting one because a lot of times in what I'll call conventional strategy textbooks, we think about, oh, you know, you're competing on price or you're competing on quality or you're competing on yeah. whatever. Um, what we don't talk about is how do you get your competitor to behave the way that you want them to, <laughs> yes. you know, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And after, you know, and uh, the very academic- soon. Very absolutely jujitsu. Then uh, take it and make it your own. Entice your competitor into retreat. Break compromises. Hardball M and A. Changing the field of play. So just some really interesting, as you put it, strategies that always work if you can pull them off, right? But Rita, the, the 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 point I'd like to to make at at this stage is of all the strategies, the only direct one was the free delay. Mm-hmm. The rest were all indirect attacks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the most interesting strategies are always indirect strategies where people don't see it coming or people attack a, a position of weakness. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's true in the military. I mean, if, if you, uh, Liddell Hart, a very famous military historian made a, a point, which is every time a military commander has attempted a frontal attack, usually what's resulted in is a, a blot on their record. Because it's very hard. And Bruce mm-hmm. used to say, Bruce Innocent used to say, you have to have about a six to one advantage mm-hmm. to win on a direct attack. Mm-hmm. In direct attacks, you can actually win with less than a, a one to one advantage. You can actually win with a disadvantage if the competitor doesn't understand what's happening. Mm-hmm. So much of today's strategies are indirect in their formation. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's go back to the, the dark side of time, because I think this is yes. another thing that fascinates me, which is we find something, right? We figure it out before anybody else gets it. We make it work for us. And then the rest of the world catches up. (laughs) So in that article, you basically said that the Japanese had perfected this art of basically impoverishing themselves by competing so aggressively on time. True. Uh, Having observed, having lived and observed Japanese competition for decades, the one thing I've noticed about the Japanese is that they don't argue over a good idea. You know, I go to Europe, I go to the uh, the U.S., and people will argue whether lean makes sense. And they'll argue for years whether lean makes sense. The Japanese will look at it and say, it works for Toyota, it's going to work for me. Uh, And they swarm. Mm -hmm. Time was an example of swarming. Mm -hmm. Uh, They all became focused on time, particularly the time it takes to develop new products. Uh, And they took the concept beyond the point of usefulness. Mm -hmm. Ted Levitt, a very famous professor of marketing at the Harvard Business School, uh, now deceased, had a great phrase, which is too much of anything will kill you. (laughs) And that's true with any strategy. Too much of any strategy will kill you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, that's what was happening with time. And the Japanese had gone past the point where time was relevant to consumers. And think, think about uh, at least I do, the early days of calculators uh, where it was all about cost and uh, getting the price of the pr- product down so it could get into more hands uh, in such effect you could buy a calculator or a watch in the, in the line at the grocery store. Um, but it reached the point where people no, don't care about price anymore. And the winning companies were companies like Casio uh, who came in and said, no, they actually, customers actually want features. And they're willing to pay a few bucks more to get a feature. Mm -hmm. And so people speed past the goalpost and run into the wall. That's interesting. Um, Super interesting. And the dark side was about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it was, it was a call to uh, uh, action to to recognize that don't get over focused on time Mm -hmm. and really don't lose focus on the customer. Mm -hmm. That's why I've been so, you know, I've I've really enjoyed watching Amazon and Bezos because Anything people have brought to him about what Amazon should do that's new, he always starts by saying, what's good? What's good about this for the customer? Right. And he works backwards. Right. Right. Very, Um, very big principle there. And I think it holds it almost all strategies is is one has to start with a customer and work backwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So what, what do you make of Japan right now? Well, you know, Japan to me is a failure of government. Mm. It's not a failure of companies. Japan mm-hmm. still has incredibly strong companies. Mm-hmm. Toyota is still the world's, I would argue, the world's most effective, efficient, low-cost, productive automotive company in the world. At some point, 
they got to watch their own, their own dark side might catch up with them. And indeed it probably has in some respects because, you know, BMW has carved off an area mm-hmm. that serves them quite well. Mm-hmm. But having said that, I think, you know, Toyota has done a nice job of digressing. They've done a nice job of, of taking over certain segments. Mm-hmm. Like they, had, they do have a strong position in luxury. They own the, the hybrid business. If they don't make the hybrid car, they supply the technology. Uh, so they're very powerful. But Canon's the same way. Um, uh, Komatsu, uh, Miniba. I would just go down the list. It's always a good. And so what's happened is, is those sectors where the government's uh, restricted competition are the sectors that are in trouble. And that would be big sectors like retail. Mm-hmm. and financial services. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's produced a lot of poorly performing companies that are a drag on the economy. Interesting. Um, that's interesting. And so, you know, we, we warn our clients that we actually don't have to make much of a warning because they can feel it in the marketplace, you know, not to write the Japanese off. Um, it's the people that aren't actually competing that tend to write the Japanese off. <laughs> right. So, um, Couple of couple of uh, big picture questions. Um, whether do you have a, a go to set of texts that you use? Um, one of our listeners is asking: Is there something that knits together your stuff, my stuff, Roger Martin's stuff? You know, the the field of strategy today. <laughs> well, you know, but, but the text I hand out to new employees when they want, you know, I'm the old guy, so they come in the office and <laughs> talk with me. And so I, I give out books. One book I give out almost all the time is, is by Liddell Hart. It's called On Strategy. Mm-hmm. It's not about business. It's about 3,000 years of military competition mm. and what people can learn. Mm-hmm. And probably if the, the, at the most basic level, it's, it's whatever you're thinking about doing, think about applying it indirectly. Uh, and not where your customer is expecting it. That's going to be a competitor is expecting it. Interesting. So that's a book I always hand out. Mm-hmm. That's great. Another that's book I hand out is, is written by a woman named Jane Jacobs mm-hmm. called uh, Cities and the Wealth of Nations. Mm-hmm. And I won't do a book review here, but it's, it, the, the basic concept is that the unit of economic uh, competition in the world is not the country. The country is an arbitrary mm-hmm. boundary. The unit is a city. Oh, that's interesting. And, and you can see it, you know, at night when you fly an airplane or from a, a satellite photo, those are what the boundaries should look like, not what mm-hmm. the, the political boundaries are. Mm-hmm. But then she goes on to talk about exchange rates, which I've always found interesting. Um, and the fact that countries like the United States have a, a single exchange rate, which people consider to be it's advantage, but it's not. It actually makes, at some points, it makes New York think it's rich. Mm. It makes Chicago thinks it's going out of business. Mm. That's not true. If they were, had their own currencies, which they did at one point, by the way, mm. until the late 1800s, uh, they would get very fast feedback. So the fast growing economies of, of the more recent uh, history have been city states. Most of them in Asia, in fact, like almost Singapore. all of them in Asia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And even Japan, effectively, if you Look at Osaka and Tokyo mm-hmm. as a pair as a city state. Mm-hmm. And so they get very fast feedback. Mm-hmm. The feedback's very important here. Mm-hmm. So what I try to do when people ask me for these books is not point people to strategy textbooks. Um, although I like Roger Martin's books. Mm-hmm. They're good. Mm-hmm. Um, I try to point them to books that help them think about the nature of human interactions and how uh-huh. people try to win. Uh-huh. Um, That's great. So um, your colleague, Martin Reeves, is with us, and uh, he's curious about what you think the big ideas are that younger people should start to be thinking about um, today. I think a big idea that younger people need to think about is uncertainty. I think more and more uh, business dialogue is going to be about how to deal with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I think at the root of dealing with uncertainty is time. Um, it's probably the single most powerful weapon to use against uncertainty is not leaving yourself exposed for a great deal of time. Mm -hmm. So I think that's quite important. Mm -hmm. Um, I think people cannot let off the fact that the customer is what it's all about. 
uh, and to invest time in understanding the customer. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there are a lot of problems in the world that companies feel the pain of these problems. Like congestion is a great example. Uh, most of the companies I've been involved with, most of the clients accept congestion like they accept air. You know, we have to live with it. You don't have to live with it. You know, if I can figure out a way to use congestion in, against you, this goes back to hardball, mm-hmm. I can do nasty things to you. Mm-hmm. If I understand the economics of congestion mm-hmm. and, and invest against those economics, I can do nasty things to you. Mm-hmm. So people might be having long supply chains that you know, start somewhere in a low-cost country and end up in New York uh, for cost. Mm-hmm. Um, I can actually beat those people by putting an airplane at the middle of that equation. Mm-hmm. I'll pay a higher price to do that mm-hmm. but because I understand the economics of congestion better than my competitors. I make more money. Mm-hmm. And that's the beginning of, of securing a competitive advantage that actually makes more money. So I think that's an important one. I love that way of thinking because when I look around me and I don't know about you, but I'm getting these like weak signals getting much stronger that the whole global supply and service network is just creaking. Um, You know, I can't talk to a human being these days without some horror story of, you know, big box retailer named X um, just not being able to follow through on the service end of things, Um, you know, and, and it's creaking at the seams, literally falling apart. And then you couple that with this inexorable push to try to take human beings out of the equation and (sighs) anything more complicated than push here to, you know, replenish your order gets handled really badly. And I think, I think that's an opportunity that's going to open up for companies that figure, figure out that, that, that people are not necessarily just a cost, you know, that if you, again, start with the customer and work back, you're going to have a much better opportunity to do something new. But in my opinion, 90% of the management teams out there accept a lot of problems of the world as givens. Mm -hmm as opposed to opportunities. Mm. Because if I can deal with the problem more effectively than my competitor could deal with the problem, I can do nasty things to them. And it, it doesn't really require a lot of invention. It just says, understand the end in economics. Mm-hmm. And I may put money here to have an advantage over there. Mm-hmm. Most people, it's a system way of thinking. Most people mm-hmm. don't think in terms of systems. No. No. And they don't think in terms of exponentials either. You know, no. I mean, human beings really struggle with that. In fact, we go to the popular press, or even politicians, they don't even think in terms of cause and effect. <laughs> People would like to sidestep cause and effect and go straight to the solution. Right, right. One of my all-time favorite awful examples is, is in an innovation. So, you know, you have a company, they give the go-to to some kind of innovation function, and it actually delivers something that customers want. It starts to get into the market, but, you know, there's a lot that's wrong with it, right? So the operations aren't quite pinned down and the financing doesn't quite work. And that, and so what happens is some operational manager gets brought in to clean things up. <laughs> um, typically, the, the group that was actually responsible for the innovation is either disbanded or forgotten. Um, the person who now is doing the cleanup gets all the credit for having brought this innovation into the world, and the company completely forgets how it got the innovation thing to work to begin with. And it's just this mythology of what happens well, after. It's, it's, you know, it, I'm not old enough that I can, think I, I can say this with certainty. There, there is a, a, a half-life of management technology. Mm-hmm. You know, for example, at the Boston Sully Group, when I sat on the executive committee, I would say the half-life was about three years. So every, you know, if we look at the, the mix of partners at any point in time, half the partners had only been partners for about three years or so. That meant the institutional memory was about three years. Ah, mm-hmm. And it was shrinking because uh, the, the, the other half was, was diminishing as a percentage. Um, I think that's true for a, a lot of, I think it's true for many companies. But for example, I, I spent a lot of time uh, talking to many Japanese executives of successful companies like Toyota. And when I get to talking to the executives, they do not understand how Toyota came to be what it is today. They see this part of the world that they live through. And I think that's another opportunity uh, to bring fresh thinking into an old uh, industry uh, that has a management team that has, this is how we've done it. As Forever. As, this is what could be done. Right. Um, I think your example of, of the innovation team being disbanded or being lost is an example that people lose sight 
of what made them successful. That's probably the biggest risk of Amazon is that they lose sight of it. Now, I think he's done a, Bezos has done a good job of hard, hardwiring that. Um, in terms of culture, you actually can't hardwire it in terms of anything else but that. So well, it's going to take a long time to dissipate, but it, 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 it'll go. I was interviewing one of their senior leaders and uh, he was talking about, and he gave a really great example of how this culture is embedded. And he talked about, they have 14 rules, right? And when you're explaining yourself to someone, right, you might violate one of those rules, but if you can couch it in terms of, well, I honor, in order to honor these three rules, I had to break that one. And, and they said, that's a very acceptable conversation there. I've very seldom met companies that made that kind of thought process that crystal clear. Well, my first reaction that it's 14 rules is probably 11 too many. <laughs> Just to deal with a complex organization, it's hard to propagate a lot of ideas, mm-hmm. a lot of rules. But they've had them from the beginning. You know, I think um, I think what often happens is, is, you know, you'll have an organization and it's January. So it's all about innovation. And now it's March. Oh, we got to get efficient. Then it's December. Quality, quality. I've been talking about quality. And then, and, you know, it's just this like, like people just don't stick to things, (laughs) you know, and in a world of hardball strategy, that's a problem. I think one of the big eye openers for me is, is in the early years of strategy at BCG, we would not have given management much credit. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we had this thing called the rule of three and four, which is you typically have three competitors. Uh, uh, number one is twice as pro- profitable as number two. Number two is twice as profitable as number three. In many respects, that, it's hard to re- reproduce that today, um, but it, it can be found. Mm-hmm. Um, but good management actually counts for something. I remember mm-hmm. I got involved with this project at General Electric. Uh, where I was looking at uh, the performance of joint ventures that they'd taken over. So they get into a market, mainly Japan or China, and they'd have 50% or less. At some point, usually because of investments, they end up taking over the, 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 uh, the uh, operation and it ends up being more profitable. And you have to admit, despite all the troubles that GE uh, G has now, they produce good managers. And so I think the big shift in strategy we touched on a little bit earlier is the behavioral component, mm-hmm. um, which is not structural. It's it's how do people do things? Right, right. And I think how do that's build, how, how do they, you know these rules, for example, are an example of behavior. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So one of the more interesting things I think about strategy is that we're going from advantages that are sort of product or service attributes, right, to advantages that are much more. I'll call them ecosystem driven and interact like um, Eric Joachim Stoller talks about interaction fields that you know, John Deere, for example, you know, the yes. tractor is just one information generation node in a whole farm management system. Um, I'm curious, do you see that? Do you, do you oh, see yeah. more of that? Yeah, I, I would say as early as 1991, we started talking about something called the Janus strategy, which is, I'm not simply a competitor, a competitor of one company. I'm a competitor of companies that I supply. I'm a competitor of companies I buy from. It's now become ecosystems. Mm-hmm. Um, but once one opens a lens to all of that, a whole bunch of things come into play. Mm-hmm. And so John Deere actually and, and Caterpillar have changed the definition of, the, of their business because of that because they can do things they couldn't do before when they thought of themselves simply as a single company Mm -hmm. in the chain. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think we'll see more and more of that. I think what, what, what produces that though is two, two things. One is customers have needs and competitors are doing something. It, you know, it isn't some sort of step function change in the way we think about the world is it's actually people are getting pushed in that direction. Mm -hmm. Um, In the case of, of uh, construction equipment, which I'm quite familiar with, uh, the cost of downtime is huge. And there's all sorts of ways of dealing with that cost of downtime. You can put a lot of inventory in the field, you put a lot of people in the field, that's the old style way. Yeah, the new way is the equipment can tell you what's wrong with it before, even before it happens. Mm-hmm. And so we see more and more of that now. GE aircraft engines, for example, continuously reports their performance to the ground. Mm-hmm. You may recall that they was it Malaysian airline 370 that got lost 
the only real information people had was coming from the engine. Wow. Uh, being reported to the ground. Huh. Uh, and so I think we'll see more and more of that. I, I think the really interesting issue there, back to regulation, is when does that become an invasion of privacy for people? Mm-hmm. And I think it becomes an invasion of privacy when, when customers don't want it. Right. But right. Uh, you know, I'd like Apple to be able to, tell, be able to tell me where my iPhone is. And as long as I have to give them some of my privacy way to do that, I'm willing to do it until something else happens. <laughs> yeah. I well, I think to me, well, part of the tipping point there is more... Like, like I'm not, I'm not given the chance to make a choice. Like if, if you yes. said, okay, I'll, uh, you know, I give you permission to, to find out where I am so I can be reconnected with my beloved device, you know, that that's, that's fine. The ones I mind are the ones where, you know, behind the scenes data is getting sold to third parties and they're, you know, compiling profiles on people and they're doing all this stuff and, and they know consumers would not give them permission to do it. That's where I think the gray line gets crossed to me. Well, I think the opportunity, uh, the way to avoid that, threat is to pursue an opportunity. The opportunity is to understand how customers are experiencing a customer, excuse me, a product or a service. Mm -hmm. And it's more simply than what a customer needs. It's it's how how are people living with this particular product? Mm -hmm. And how can I make them want what I can offer? Mm -hmm. Whereas I think what you're alluding to is I could offer something, so I'm gonna force it on them. Exactly. And then we'll learn the hard way, what flies and what doesn't fly. Well, eventually. Eventually. Oh, yeah. And so I think in today's world, it probably happens quicker. I think consumers move a lot faster. I mean, well, the, the, the sources of information are more varied and much cheaper. Well, in the early days of e commerce at BCG, I was amazed at how many clients we worked with whose customers did not value their own personal time. You know, they were willing to get a lower price, so willing to drive 20 miles to a Walmart. Really? Uh, and it was a long change that we saw coming to, to, to people start valuing their time. Hmm. It, it, it was evident it was true because people who did have a lot of time and had a lot of money were already demonstrating behaviors that said, you know, I'm willing to pay for some things that will save me time or to avoid the loss of time. Hmm. The inter- I, I told you I really wasn't too interested to talk about COVID, but what COVID did was it through government fiat was force people not to be able to shop. And really forced the only alternative was to shop online Mm -hmm. for a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And now people have got a real strong sense of what their time is worth. Mm -hmm. Maybe not dollars and cents, but what it's worth emotionally and personally. Right. And I'm having all these conversations about back to work, you know, and then my answer at the moment is nobody knows. The only way we're going to figure this out is through a lot of planned and unplanned experiments of various yes. kinds. But it is fascinating to me how the higher up the hierarchy you go, the more they want to be in the office. And, you know, the guys on the back, you know, the cubicle whoa, whoa. farms with the headphones on, they don't want it because we've now learned we can do a lot of stuff without having uh, to. Be, I'll share you some data from the Toronto office of the boss. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, when it became clear that the office might be able to open, which unfortunately was eight months ago, (laughs) still not really opened yet. Actually, it's not really opened yet. Um, A survey was done of, of, of the employees. And we did it in a way that allows us to know if the respondent was an assistant, uh, if the respondent was an associate, a new hire, if there was all the way up to the respondent was a senior partner. And what really surprised me when I looked at the data was the more senior the people were in the company, the less interest they were coming back to the office. Really? That they really found that, uh, in fact, you can see, I think on a personal standpoint, their lives, the more senior people experience more disruption in their lives because of fragmentation, travel, all the things that, that is in that Fast Company article about me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this, this has enabled people to reduce that pain on the family. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would have expected quite the opposite. I would have expected a, uh, they want their people around them. Uh, but they, you know, to, for the people to be around them, they then have to be in the office themselves. So I don't know how it's going to play out. I think there's going to be a lot of counterintuitive stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. And well, I and it gets, it gets to the fundamental unit of work, right? Which is, which is um, something 
you know, we're still living with this overhang of an industrial age when you had to go to the place where the asset was because that's the only work got done. And now we're in a world of distributed assets. And, you know, when your workforce goes home, when, you know, when all the assets in your company basically go out the door every night, that's a different way of thinking about work. My daughter works for a fashion company. And I would have thought she would need to be at work a lot. Mm -hmm. She just got it. It's a very successful company. She's got a notice from corporate, which is don't plan on ever coming back to work. Hmm. And so what they've had to do is figure out, now it's not quite true. What they've had to do is figure out how, how to run the business remotely. Mm-hmm. And they can do pretty much 95% of what they need to do without being in the office. And for these guys, mm-hmm. it's you know made a huge impact in response time, mm-hmm. uh, huge impact on, you know, I really think the interesting side of, casually here is going to be commercial real estate. Mm-hmm. I think not 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 warehouses, but office buildings. Mm-hmm. I think are really going to take it in the shorts. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's interesting, you know. Speaking of the competitive advantages of cities, you know, we're now seeing smaller mid-tier cities having some of those advantages that they couldn't before. So they can now attract talent that they couldn't before. They can now, you know, attract investment that they couldn't before. And so that's an interesting hypothesis that we'll start to see some more of this distributed value creation than the kind of centralized model we were getting to before. And you know, the city after city, at least in North America, the real estate story is people moving out of the cities, mm-hmm. either full-time or part-time. Mm-hmm. And um, that has a huge impact on the spaces they leave behind. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I'm hearing about people getting apartments in New York that they never could have dreamed of affording, you know, in the before times, which is which is interesting. You know, uh, that it's actually now flown through that 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 to that sector. Well, I was talking to my daughter who lives in New York, and she's in par- apartment hunting, and I was expecting exactly that story from her. Mm-hmm. What a what a turkey shoot this is going to be. She said the problem she's having right now is she doesn't need a big place, but she's finding that the people that used to commute to the city now will take a place in the city. Mm. They can spend more time at home uh-huh. and spend uh-huh. less time commuting. And so, it's, so they'll it's do a produced, day or two in New York. So it's, yeah. it's produced a new form of competitor in the market for her. That's fascinating. <laughs> That's really interesting. So um, one question from our, from our group is how, how, how would you recommend organizations introduce fresh thinking? And by fresh thinking, I mean, we've always accepted this as the way of the world. How do, how do you get someone coming in to say, actually, no, the world doesn't have to be that way? I think they have to get outside. They have to, to go out and live with their customers. Mm. Um, one of my favorite techniques with, with, with uh, clients is to take our people and put them in the jobs of our clients. Like I put one young woman in charge in, in, in the uh, service department of a jewelry store and it produced a whole new th- view of what service was it, at this very successful brand at the store, you know, service is where people ended their careers, not started, but service is where everybody made the decision about whether they were coming back or not to that brand. And so once we understood that, we could actually what appeared to be overinvest in service uh, to build this loyalty at the retail counter with customers. So I think getting out there, mm-hmm. uh, what I call walking the line is another good one, which is, mm-hmm. okay, I have a customer and now I'm going to go all the way back through all the suppliers to figure out what's happening. It's, it's really I, eye-opening. It really I, is. I, and I, I think we're going to see some sea changes in how we think about Certainly how we think about supply chains, you know, the fact that a chip shortage somewhere in Asia could, you know, uh, kneecap General Motors. I mean, that's just amazing to me <laughs> that there's no sort of there's no resilience. There's no plan B. <laughs> let me let me use our last minute to to share a pet peeve. OK. Uh, it, long before lean became popular, we were involved in ju- just in time. And today, the rap on just in time is they can't deal with these uh, unreliable supply chains. Uh, and you have to move to just in case, which is where everything was before. Uh, but in reality, I can, you know, I can show you the economics uh, and the physical response times of a just in time system are that it will crash faster than a just in case system, but it will come back five or six times faster mm. than a just in case system will. Mm. 
Interesting. And that's a huge cost advantage to be able to do that. And so, you know, everybody's wringing their hands about supply chain. Toyota's not wringing his hands about supply chains right now. Not at all. I mean, they got the problems, like everybody has problems, but their system actually is much more responsive. They can handle a product recall faster than any company in the world can handle it because their system responds so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a fascinating thing to watch. They had, a, they had a factory burned down in Japan, which made 99% of all the J valves for brakes in the cars around the world. Everybody said, USA Today, this is the end of ju just, uh, just in time in Toyota. It wasn't. They were, they were up and running in two weeks. <laughs> they were back. There was a factory that was owned by a, a Western competitor that made airbags that blew up and burned to the ground. That factory never came back. Mm. And they lost a dominant position at most of the major OEMs that they had to second source competitors because the OEMs couldn't trust them anymore. Wow. Well, that is a great example of systems thinking to wrap up our conversation. George, it's such a pleasure. We shouldn't leave it this long until the next I'm time. I'm looking forward to seeing you in person. I don't know when, but soon, I hope. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. So everybody, thank you so much. Have a great holiday, those of you that are in the U.S. And uh, thank you, George. Look thank forward you. to our next conversation. Great. Thanks I do everyone. too. Bye. Don't be a stranger.